Hello everybody, my name is uh, Thomas Scheine. I'm a sixth year medical student studying at the Medical University of Lublin in Poland. I'm also an ECG instructor on Lub ECG. And this is my first out of hopefully many movies to come and I am going to talk about ECG arrhythmias. Uh, this is basically what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we'll start with the, just the basics. Uh, hopefully you've been watching the videos that we have posted before. Because uh, I kind of hope you know uh, the basics before you start this one. So if you haven't seen the previous movies, just take a look at them before you look at this. I will start with premature atrial uh, contractions, uh, which is a fairly, actually, the most common arrhythmias. We'll also cover tachycardias, fibrillations, flutter, atrial ventricular blocks, and lastly, I will talk about boundary branch blocks. Okay, so in the previous movies, you uh, were shown uh, these five easy steps uh, to analyze uh, ECG strip. Uh, and just do yourself a favor and just use these five steps every time you are to analyze a uh, ECG strip. Uh, and hopefully you won't miss anything important. This should cover uh, mostly the basics. So I'll just fast just go through them uh, just to refresh your memory. First of all we have rate and when we talk about rate we talk about the uh, the beats per minute, how many beats uh, you have per minute. Uh, when we talk about rate and, and arrhythmias, it's also very important that we know how to uh, analyze the different intervals that we have. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, rhythm is the electrical signal originating from the SA node or is it an ectopic beat? Very important. Axis hypertrophy and signs of ischemia which is also uh, very important and during this lecture this is how we're going to solve the ECGs. Uh, talking about the intervals and this is just something you have to learn by heart because uh, you you really have to know it uh, yeah, let's start. Uh, the PR interval, uh, which is from the start of the P wave to the start of the Q wave. Uh, it's supposed to last from three to five small squares. If you remember from, from looking at ECGs, you have five small squares in a large square. So you basically say if the PR interval is more than one large square, it's too long. Why is that important? Well you will have what we call a atrial ventricular block. I will talk more about that later. Uh, the QRS complex, which is from the start of the Q wave, which is this deflection from the isoelectric line, and to the end of the S, is supposed to be equal to or less than half a large square. Uh, and this is also very important. You also have the QT interval, uh, this is a bit more complicated because the QT interval is calculated from the the heart rate. So there's no fixed uh, set of numbers that you can use. Uh, so we will just skip that for now. We will come back to this uh, in another lecture. Okay, so just to refresh your memory, I have uh, ECG strip here. You can pause the video if you want to solve it, and then we will go through it step by step. Okay, so let's start about with let's start with the rate. Uh, firstly, we have to figure out if this is a regular or an irregular rhythm, uh, and the way we find we can find find this out fairly quickly is that we count the s the big squares uh, between the RRs, and you can only take one because if there is uh, an irregularity uh, in the RR uh, complexes. Uh, just counting one RR interval will not give you the correct uh, numbers. So we check, we count, start here, one, two, three, four, five 
and a half. One, two, three, four, five and a half. One, two, three, four, almost five and a half. So we can guess that or guess we we know that this is fairly regular. When we know that a strip is regular, uh, we can count we can count and calculate the rhythm from one RR interval. And hopefully you learned that in the previous video. So let's take this RR interval. Uh, you can pick wherever you want on the sheet between two R waves. So we have 300, 150, 175, and 60. So more or less 60. That's the rate. Okay, let's look at the intervals. If you remember the PR interval, which is from the start of the P to the start of the Q wave, is this more than one big square? No, it's not. Let's look at the QRS. Let's find a, a suitable QRS. What about this one? Is this equal to or less than three small squares or a half, half a big block? Yeah, it's nice, it's slim, it's just the way it's supposed to be. Uh, is it a sinus rhythm? Is it a sinus rhythm? How do we figure out if it's a sinus rhythm? We look for P's, P waves, in front of every QRS. Here's a P wave, there is a P wave, there is a P wave, there is a P wave. And sometimes you don't see P waves in all the leads. But as long as you can see P waves in some of the leads, it means that you have a sinus rhythm. Uh, and you have a sinus rhythm here which is good. Next is axis. We use the two thumbs up rule which states if lead one is positive, you have a positive QRS, it is, and lead AVF is positive, yes you have a positive deflection, not anything negative, you have two thumbs up meaning that you have a normal axis. Very good. Signs of uh, hypertrophy, well you have a fairly big R wave in V3 and V4 which might indicate that there is some hypertrophy here. Are we seeing any signs of ischemia? And with signs of ischemia we're thinking about ST elevation or non-ST elevations. In one, no. In two, clearly you have a ST elevation. In three, yes. You have depression in AVL, another elevation in AVF, and also in the precordial leaves, leads V6 and V5. This will, uh, taking the clinical picture into consideration, uh, be a typical of an inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. Did you get it? Perfect. Okay, so let's talk a little about cardiac electrophysiology. What is what is uh, important to know from this, and hopefully you had it during your uh, physiology uh, classes, if you went to medical school, you know that each and every cell in the heart, either they're mon monocytes or nerve cells, even cells in the vena cava and uh, pulmonary veins, are pacemakers. They can all pacemake if they need to. This means that in any myocyte in the heart they can start to propagate a uh, electrical signal which will propagate through the heart causing the heart to contract. Uh, and if you can see here monocytes conduct fast that means the muscles of the heart, muscle cells the nerve fibers conduct five to eight times faster, meaning that the nerve fibers of the heart, there's, this is sort of like a, a highway for the electrical signal. It travels much faster, giving the signal or spreading the signal throughout the heart and uh, propagating their signal to the monocytes, which all cause 
the heart to contract. Uh, but as we know, as I just told you, the every cell can um, can start to uh, give off a signal which will cause a contraction. Uh, and this will be what we call an ectopic beat. Uh, just to uh, tell you about the golden rule uh, which makes uh, classifying the arrhythmias uh, very simple uh, is we divide it first of all into supraventricular and ventricular. Supraventricular basically means that the signal is originating from the atria. Uh, the way that you can see this on a ECG where the signal originates from is by the QRS complex. If the signal originates from the atria, you will have a QRS complex that is less than one half large square. A QRS complex that is small and slim. And that's what we want to see when we look at QRS complexes. We want them thin. If you have a signal that originates from the ventricle, uh, a ventricular arrhythmia, you will almost always have a QRS complex with, which is larger than one big square, one half large square. Sorry. Uh, there is there there is one exception, and that is if the uh, ectopic beat originates close to the bundle of his, meaning that the signal will. Uh, catch into the uh, to the bundle branches you will have a thin QRS complex but this rarely happens so as a golden rule uh, if it if, if the signal originates in the atria you have a thin a small uh, QRS if it's in the ventricle you have a big thick wide QRS <sighs> to demonstrate uh, the golden rule and also talk about the most common arrhythmia, uh, one that you definitely will will encounter, we have the premature uh, contractions either of the atria or the ventricle. Uh, these are not connected to to any pathology, uh, and it basically it basically means that you have one of the cells in the heart, either in the uh, atria or ventricle, which sends out a signal that uh, depolarizes the heart, starting not from the SA node, but from the point where it originated. Uh, and if we just apply the golden rule to these two strips right here, can you guess which one is originating from the atria and which one is from the ventricle? Well, as we talked about, uh, if the ectopic bead is originating from the atria, you will have thin QRS complexes everywhere. If they originate from the ventricle, you will suddenly have a thick one. Same as this one. These are two ectopic beads originating from the ventricle. And here you have an ectopic bead here. This is the ectopic bead. You see you have uh, a regular P, Q, R, and S, and T complex here, 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 and then you suddenly have uh, a complex which appears sooner than it's supposed to. This is a premature contraction. And, as I said, not connected to any pathology. Uh, let's talk about tachycardia. Uh, still divided into supraventricular and ventricular tachycardias. Tachycardia basically means that you have a heart rhythm which is more than 100 beats per minute. The supraventricular tachycardia, again applying the the golden rule, tells us that we have thin QRS complexes. Okay, how do we know that this is a tachycardia? Well, we count between the RRs, so 300, 150. So about 150 beats per minute. This is a tachycardia. The reason why we know it's supraventricular is because of the width of the QRS complexes. And as you can see, we have P, QRS, 
P Q R S T P Q R S T Here it's one uh, another example. Here you don't have P's P waves. Why is this a tachycardia? Well we can count again. Let's just find suitable RR interval. Take this one, 300, 150. So you have a tachycardia, 150 beats per minute, no P waves. And why were there P waves on the first one and not this one? Well, that all depends on where the signal is originating from. If we go back to the to the previous, we can say that the 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 P wave, the signal is originating from somewhere close to the SA node. Just think how the signal travels uh, towards an electrode. In the other one, we can most definitely say that the signal is uh, somewhere closer to the AV node because we don't have P waves so they don't we don't we're not able to read uh, any activity in the atria okay ventricular tachycardia again applying the golden rule as we see on this QRX complex QRS complexes they are large larger than one half half large square larger and you might think, okay, why is this not a ventricular fibrillation? Well, first of all, we haven't talked about fibrillation yet. Uh, we will come to that in the next slide. But as you can see, they are very regular. They are monotonously regular. And that's the hallmark of ventricular tachycardia. By the way, this is a uh, uh, life-threatening uh, arrhythmia. Uh, and you would need to defib defibrillate uh, these patients. Here again you have a form, a sort of uh, ventricular tachycardia and you see they are very regular and you see the, the, the heart rate is about 150 beats per minute. Okay, so what about this one? As we can see, applying the golden rule uh, for the QRS complexes, or if we can even call these QRS complexes, the complexes are wide. They are wide. So we know that the signal is originating somewhere in the ventricle. And why is this not a ventricular tachycardia? Well, it's highly irregular. As you can see, this is that this doesn't look at all like uh, the previous pictures. They are not regular. This is total chaos. Uh, and total chaos is the hallmark of fibrillations. And basically fibrillations mean that you have multiple foci uh, in the heart which sends out signals uh, which uh, depolarize and repolarize uh, without any control. This is total chaos of the heart. Uh, and that's a fibrillation uh, in comparison to a tachycardia, which is uh, regular. There's no chaos. There's still just one foci that sends out a signal that propagates through the heart. Uh, this, way, this is also a life-threatening um, uh, condition, which will need defibrillation. Uh, when it comes to atrial fibrillations, which is uh, much more regular, uh, it's, in fact, it's very, very common, uh, you still have this chaos, uh, but it's in the atrium. And as you know, the, the atria and the ventricle, they're separated. And the only way from the atria to the ventricles is via the AV node. Uh, and the genius thing about the AV node is that it's, it can selectively uh, choose which signal they want to propagate through the ventricle uh, meaning that even though you have chaos in the atria you can still have uh, you can still have a much more order in the ventricle uh, it is 
the hallmark of atrial fibrillation is its irregularity between their QRS complexes. Uh, you have no visible P waves. Even though you think you might see P waves, uh, they're not P waves. They are chaotic, uh, chaotic waves that we call F waves or fibrillation waves. Okay, so you see a normal ECG on the top here, and then you see atrial fibrillation here. Uh, you might think that you are. Yeah, what about these? waves aren't they P waves no they're not this is chaos uh, and you're lucky if you get a ECG strip like that because you can not even get a flat isoelectric line it doesn't have to look like this uh, and the way that you can be sure that this is uh, atrial fibrillation is the irregularities between the RR intervals as you can see there is total chaos between them this is highly irregular and this irregularity and the absence of P waves in front of the QRS complexes is the hallmark of atrial fibrillations. Here is one more and here you can see there's not that much chaos on the isoelectric line as you can see it's it's fairly flat but there are no distinguishable P waves and you see that it's highly irregular intervals between the R's. This is atrial fibrillation. You have the same here, a little more chaotic, uh, but still the irregularities is what gives it away. And as you can see, the QRS complexes are small they're uh, not wide at all, meaning that the uh, arrhythmic foci is in the atrium. Then you have flutter. Flutter is basically a, a form of extreme tachycardia. It can either be atrial or ventricular, but these are still uh, just a form of tachycardia. Uh, you will often seen, see that uh, flutter uh, changes they switch from tachycardia to flutter to fibrillations to flutter to fibrillations uh, the characteristic of, of atrial flutter is the sawtooth appearance if you can see this if you were to remove uh, the QRS complexes this would look like saw teeth and it's highly characteristic uh, so basically, you just have to think, if you have a uh, ventricular, or if you have a tachycardia, which is very fast, uh, over 160, always just think that this might be flutter. But look for the characteristic sawtooth appearance. Then we go to the... Uh, atrioventricular blocks and a block basically means that you have a miscommunication between the atria and the ventricle and uh, this is uh, a conduction malfunction and you can divide this uh, into three different grades uh, degrees you have the first degree AV block which means that all P waves are conducted. Please remember, first degree, all P waves are conducted. Uh, the only thing, and this is why it's important to follow the five steps that we have taught you, is that you have a prolonged PR interval, more than one large square. As you can see, the PR interval is too long, meaning that the signal from the SA nodes node takes too much time getting into the ventricle. It means you have a first degree AV block. All P waves are conducted. Still, after every P wave, you find a QRS complex, as you can see. Not so on the second degree AV block, where only some of the P waves are conducted into the ventricle. Only some. And just to make it 
much easier for you. We have, of course, divided the secondary degree blocks into two types. We have Mobits Type 1 and Mobits Type 2. So let's talk about Mobits Type 1 first. Uh, this is what's called the Venkebuck uh, Mobits. Uh, why it's called the Venkebuck, I do not know. Uh, it basically means that you have a prolongation of the PR intervals in every heartbeat. Uh, but not all P's are conduct P waves are conducted. So let's see, we have the first interval here, PR. We have the second, and as you can see, the PR interval is prolonging, it's longer. The third, we have a very long prolongation. And on the fourth, it's not able to uh, conduct into the ventricle. So you have three P waves followed by QRS complexes with a prolongation of the PR interval in every beat until it cannot longer um, send the signal into the, the ventricle. And just to make it a little easier, uh, I put in a picture of, uh, of uh, Dr. Venkebach himself and as you can see in type Mobitz type 1 uh, you will have room for one picture of Dr. Venkebach before uh, the P waves, P waves are no longer uh, conducted into the QRS, into the ventricles. So in Mobitz type 1 you can fit one picture in the last QRS, in the last PR interval. Mobitz type 2, the same, you have uh, only some of the P waves that are um, conducted into the ventricle, giving rise to a QRS. As you can see, you have PR interval, and you have a P, which is P wave, which is not conducted. P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS, P wave, not conducted. And do you think you could fit a picture of uh, Dr. Venke back in here? No chance, no chance. It's just not big enough. So this is type 2. You would never fit it. So, which one is this? P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q. R, S, T, and then nothing. And you can even fit a picture of Dr. Venkebach. So this would then be type 1, because you can only fit one picture. Get it? Very good. Third degree, it's thir <laughs> third degree AV block. No P waves are conducted into the ventricles. Not a single one is conducted. As you can see, the P, you have a P wave, yes, and you have a QRS and a T. Suddenly you have a P wave occurring in the middle of, yeah, where you really wouldn't expect it to be. And then you have a P wave showing up here, and a P wave showing up here, and a P wave showing up here, and so on. Meaning that there is action, there is no connection between the atria and the ventricle. Nothing. They work totally independent from each other. It means the atria is living its life and the ventricle is going on living his life. Same here. P, P, QRS, P, P. So the P waves are regular. The QRS complexes are regular. Only they are independent of each other. So, to sum it up, first degree AV block, all P waves are conducted, but you have a prolonged Q, uh, PR interval. Second degree, some. Third degree, none. Then we're approaching the end of this lecture. I will just say a few words about, words about the bundle, bra bundle branch block. It's not the easiest word to say. Uh, the bundle branches are these nerve fibers 
here. These are the bundle branches. And their job is to conduct the signal and distribute it evenly around the heart, uh, giving rise to uh, a normal beat. When you have a blockage of a bundle branch, uh, it means that the signal will propagate through the ventricle at a much slower rate. Uh, and also, if you have, uh, this is clearly a ventricular arrhythmia, so we should be able to look into our crystal ball and think how big should the QRS complexes be? Well, they should be bigger. They should. Uh, not always, but they should. And the reason for this is that the block is uh, could be a complete or yeah they should they should uh, right bundle branch block and left bundle branch block. You have actually several uh, diagnostic criteria for this. Uh, we will just focus on one. So unless we're going to be uh, cardiologists, we basically have to keep it simple so that we can send these guys that we think have a bundle branch block to a cardiologist or, or treat them for one of the things that a bundle branch block might mean. Uh, we will talk more about that in another lecture. Uh, but basically, uh, as you know with the precordial leads, uh, V1 and V2 uh, looks at the right side of the heart. And if you have what we call a biphasic QRS in leads V1 and or V2, which is like this, uh, looks like bunny ears or um, uh, yeah, McDonald's or it's it's an M. If you have this M in V1, V1 or V2, then this might be a bundle branch block. So let's see. Uh, if we look at the QRSs, they are not that big. Uh, the QRSs are big here. Uh, and we're supposed to look in V1 and V2, and we see these characteristic M's, these bunny ears, uh, which indicates that this might be a bundle branch block. Left bundle branch block, we know that V5 and V6 of the precordial leads uh, look at the left side of the heart. Uh, so if you have these biphasic QRSs, bunny ears, uh, M's, whatever you want to call them, in lead V5 and or V6, it's indicative of left bundle branch block, uh, as we can see here. And here we clearly see that uh, the QRS complexes are fairly wide. So there's uh, no doubt that this is a ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, I hope you understand that this looks like an M, even though it didn't look as characteristic as they did on my previous example. But hopefully you get the picture. And uh, that's uh, all I wanted to say. Uh, it's the first of my m movies here on YouTube. If uh, you have any comments, please comment uh, under. And hopefully, I will make a new movie soon. Thank you very much.